Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So grateful to be here at the lotus feet of the Lordships. And try to speak something on Chaitanya Charita Amrit. So I'll speak today and tomorrow on this theme of how Lord Chaitanya demonstrates Vaishnava Siddhant through Vaishnava Sadhachar. That how he demonstrates what is the highest truth. But even he's talking here for Lambert, I will talk about the significance of the way he is interacting with him. The <clears throat> if we consider the typical biography of a person, Lord Chaitanya's biography seems to be a little unusual. Of course, very unusual in many ways, but it is, say, a person, maybe a person is a, a traveling speaker or somebody is a spiritual teacher. Then the more uh, influence they get, the more fame they get, the more success they get, then the more they try to increase their outreach. Now, suppose somebody is a speaker, the more opportunities you get to speak, the more you travel and speak, more and more. Now, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he traveled from the age of 24 to 30. That is described in the Madhya And his tours were astonishingly successful. South India tour, North India tour, they described. Phenomenally successful. And then, suddenly, after that, he stops his touring. And it's not that he's very old. He's 30. He's quite young. And he has followers, uh, dedicated followers across the country. And he suddenly, he just stops all his traveling. And in the last, not one or two, but 18 years of his life, he's just at one place. Which is that place? Jagannathpuri. So the whole Antalila is actually describing events that happened at Jagannathpuri. So, what, what is the significance of this, that the Lord suddenly stops traveling? So, the, the Lord's pastimes, of course, are many different purposes and we can't understand all of them. But if you look at the overall trajectory, what Lord Chaitanya comes to do is demonstrate, is to share pure love for Krishna in the mood of Radharani's love for Krishna. Special separation from Krishna. So at one level, there is the aspect of sharing pure love. At another level, there is the aspect of savoring pure love. So in the Antelila, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is primarily savoring that love for Krishna. And he's, it's not that he is not sharing, but he's sharing in a more quality way. That means if you see most of the chapters, see normally if somebody is traveling to various places, you can have many adventurous things happening. You know, you went go here, this happens, go there, that happens. But you're staying at one place, and more or less that place is stable. It's Jagannathpuri, at least when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was ruling, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was living at that time, Pratap Mudra was ruling, and he was a powerful king. So it was politically stable. So there was no like, tumultuous events happening. So most of the Antilila is about meetings. You are staying at one place and there's not no big things are happening at that place. Then what, what is the significant thing? It is the people that you meet over there. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, although he's in Puri, you know, he, because already the Puri temple is there, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't try to compete with that temple and create construct any other temple. Normally, if we consider as uh, devotees. What are the services that we do? You know, we build temples, we distribute books, we give classes, and we basically share Krishna consciousness in various ways. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he is in Puri, what is he doing? He is actually sharing Krishna consciousness by meeting with devotees. If you see that the chapter is meeting with Ramadas Goswami, he is meeting with Rupa Goswami, he is meeting with Sanatana Goswami, he is meeting with Arunan, Lahas Goswami. Primarily the chapters are 
just his meetings. <coughs> so, through these meetings, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is demonstrating Vaishnava Sagachara. And the Bhakti Rasamal, the Upadeshamal says that there are six characteristics of loving exchanges. Guhyam Akhyati Vrachyati Bhunte Bhojari Dejai Dadati Pratigrahanati So especially <coughs> opening our heart to others and hearing others open their heart. These six-fold loving exchanges are what bond people closer to each other. And what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is doing primarily in the Antelila is demonstrating these six-fold loving exchanges. And you will see these six-fold exchanges are demonstrated with a broad gamut of people. Normally we could say, when we interact with people, we could place the people who we meet with in different categories. Those who are, say, our admirers, our followers. And nowadays with Facebook and everything, you know, people use celebrity terminology. So when I travel around, sometimes devotees tell me, you know, I am your fan. I said, don't be my fan, please be my current. <laughs> what it means is that it is your prayers, your good wishes that can give me energy to continue my service. So there are some people who are like, are, uh, who are, are admirers or followers. There are some people who are our equals. There are some people who share similar interests. Say for example, we are Krishna Bhaktas. There might be Christians or people from other tradition who do share some similar interests. And there are some people who are our enemies, who are our critics. Now, we need to deal with all these different kinds of people. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, if you look at the Antilila, it is demonstrating how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu de deals with these different kinds of people. He says that if he is meeting with Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, that's more or less, they, it's vertical. Although Rupa and Sanatana Goswami are older than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in age, but they are all in the mood of his followers, of his subordinates. So, he is respectful to them, but there is a particular way of dealing with those who are his subordinates. Then, we could go to the other extreme. There are people who are critics. There are some people who think their full-time service is to find fault with others. <laughs> Whatever you do, it's never up to the mark. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu meets such a fault finder also. Who is that? Ramachandra Puri. Yeah, Ishwar Puri is spiritual master. And so, not exactly spiritual master, he's spiritual master's level. He is Chaitanya Ishwar Puri's god brother, basically. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is at the level of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's spiritual master. So no, it's it's one thing when uh, when some equal finds fault with us. But if some senior finds fault with us, and actually the senior is faulty, how do you deal with that? We have to follow the etiquette. At the same time, you cannot just go along with whatever they are doing. It's a difficult, delicate situation. So how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu deals with that? That's demonstrated. And in this particular chapter, uh, it is demonstrated how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu shares you could say shares and savors Krishna Prem with somebody who is from a different tradition, although it's a similar tradition. So that is Vallabha Bhatta. Now Vallabha Bhatta is also known in the Pushti Marga as Vallabha Acharya and he is a very prominent Bhakti teacher and there are thousands and thousands of his followers. So Gauya Vaishnavism and Pushti Marga are in some ways contemporaneous. They both started more or less at the same time and both of them spread. So, here Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is meeting Vallabha Bhatta for the second time. The second time, when he meet, first he has met him in Puri, sorry, in Varanasi. When he had gone for the North India tour, Vallabha Bhatta also had been there at that time. And they had a very sweet interaction. Uh, now here, there is another interaction. So in this interaction, what is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mood? Like earlier I said, when he meets with Ramachandra Puri, 
you know, because he is senior, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu does not directly counter him. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu does not directly counter um, Ramachandra Puri, but at the same time, he is he is he keeps a respectful distance. And eventually, Ramachandra Puri is trying to find faults, find faults. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tries to amend himself, and the devotees feel so fed up. And finally, when Ramachandra Puri goes away, the devotees are said they feel as if they they are able to breathe again. Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of people. Some people bring happiness wherever they go, and some people bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> so the devotees feel, and Ramchandra Puri has gone, they feel a big relief. So, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu stays respectful to him, but she continues his own devotional service, his own practices. Now, in this case, Vallabha Bhatta. We will see that there will multiple threads of interactions or multiple threads of thought in the interaction. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu here is starting by glorifying those around him. Normally, whenever we meet someone, say that person is very well known, now we know that person quite well because they are a well known person. But usually, success is never like an isolated phenomenon. It's, some people say, I'm a self-made person. Yeah, even if somebody has worked very hard against adverse circumstances, still, I, we all need some lucky breaks. We all need help and support from others. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, now Vallabh Bhatta knows his glories. Vallabh Bhatta has already interacted with him and he's appreciating Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's extraordinary devotion. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, instead of bragging how great I am, he focuses on telling the greatness of his associates. And in fact, he is putting himself, not only saying that they are great, he is putting himself in the mood of their student. He says, from Saru Bhattacharya, I have learned this. From Ramananda Rai, I have learned this. At one level, they are all his followers. In fact, Saru Bhattacharya is the person whom Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has converted. It is he who has brought Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he has brought Chaitanya uh, to a more personalistic understanding from his previous ultra logical and impersonal kind of leanings. So, although he has done this, what is he doing? He is sharing the glories of others, those who are his devotees. And he is using that as a thread of thought to establish the philosophical point that comes in this verse that Purushartha Shiromani and the summit of all goals of life is love for Krishna. So now when we have this, when we are interacting with others, normally every conversation, it's you could say it's like a train. And within that train, when the train is moving, it needs continuous fuel. If the fuel stops, the train stops. Or if the brake is applied, the train slows down. If the accelerator is applied, the train moves faster. So whenever we interact with each other, at that time, when we speak something, every word that we speak, it's like we are giving a small glimpse of our heart to the other person. Sometimes some people are very reserved, maybe very suspicious. Then they speak in a very guarded way. But then we speak something, and then, if you feel that the other person is understanding us, then their statement inspires us to open the heart a little bit more. So that means, it, each, each interaction or conversation, it can either act like a break or it can act, act like the accelerator. And then the conversation can move or it can come to a stop. Now sometimes we meet with some people and just naturally gel with them. Sometimes some people we meet and then it's it's just a formality being with them or it's like austerity being with them. Now, when both people are looking at the watch and thinking, when can we end this? So what's happening? The conversational train is not moving at all or it's just stopping and starting and stopping and starting Then it can't gain any momentum. 
So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu demonstrates here how he starts this conversation and takes it forward. So he is here in Jagannath Puri with his associates. And in one sense, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is staying at a particular place. I said earlier that his purpose while staying at one place is to demonstrate the sixfold loving exchanges. Actually, Prabhupada says in Uddishan, as mentioned that earlier, that the Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by these sixfold loving exchanges. It's interesting, and Prabhupada doesn't say that at one level the Krishna consciousness movement spreads by preaching. That's obviously true. But it's one thing just spreading, but it is another thing is it's like we spread in the sense that we plant many, many, many trees. Which is good. We increase the number of seeds that are being planted and they're growing. But what has already been planted, that also has to be nourished. Then the garden will grow as You plant new trees, but you also have to take care of existing trees. So this nourishing of the existing trees that happens through the six-fold loving exchanges. Six-fold loving exchanges, especially among those giving, giving gifts and taking gifts is uh, sometimes we may do occasionally, we may do periodically. But the giving and taking prasadam we do regularly. But what often doesn't happen is sharing the heart. And letting others share their heart into here. And when that is not there, then we all uh, experience loneliness even in association. So the most painful loneliness is not when we are physically alone. It is when we are with people who don't understand us. Then there is we, there's practically no way to get to become free from that loneliness. It feels like what do I do in such a situation? So the it is when we can hear others speak and others can hear us speak without judging, without evaluating, without criticizing. Then what happens is the exchange can flow nicely. So now we will see later that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Vallabh Bhatta, they will have some differences. And that's natural when two people come from two different traditions, and then there will be differences. But how are those differences dealt with? But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu starts, in more you could say, for Vallabh Bhatta, the start is more, in more an informational sense. When you come to a new place, you like to meet new people. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is telling, oh, he's so glorious, he's so glorious. He's saying his glory is not in terms what he has achieved, but what he has given me. But there can be different kinds of introductions. When we introduce a person, there can be like an impersonal introduction. Impersonal introduction means, okay, this person did this, 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 this. That's good. But there can also be a personal introduction. Personal introduction means, yes, this person done this, this, but this is how I know this person. This is how I have interacted. This is what I appreciate about this person. Then say, if the audience knows the introducer and the introducer knows the speaker, then what happens? If the introducer gives a more personal introduction, then the audience can link much more with them. And that's why usually the introducer has to be someone familiar to the audience. Now once I had gone for a program in a college and then, uh, so it is like two of us monks had gone. So there's one monk who introduced other monk. And then sometimes the devotees, uh, their enthusiasm overshadows their intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened is that means a devotee, while giving this introduction in the college, started speaking in the more like a Vyas Puja offering. It is a completely inappropriate introduction. And then the introduction got over and after that there was one of the students who was also a devotee, he told me that the student next to him, he said that oh, these monks, they have come to our, our college and they just glorify each other. <laughs> <laughs> so they just couldn't connect at all, which was the mode of uh, speaking was not appropriate and the speaker was also not like a bridge between the two. So if we are having a college program, then somebody from that college ideally should be introduced. If the introducer also is unknown to the people, then how are you introducing it? So there has to be an appropriate introduction to see personal introduction. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is offering this 
personal introduction. He's also saying, oh, Sarva Bhattacharya has learned in the Shaddha Sunas. Also see, it's from him I have learned the Siddhanta Bhattacharya. Another question might come over here. Is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu lying over here? Is he saying, did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu learn uh, bhakti, bhakti from the principles of Bhakti from Sarva Bhattacharya? Sometimes, uh, <coughs> I was just a few months ago in New Zealand, so one devotee asked a question that, you know, does humility have to come at the cost of honesty? <laughs> that means, in order to be humble, do we have to speak something which is not true? Then like some devotee comes, oh, Prabhu, you are a pure devotee. And now, we ourselves know, well, you are all struggling, pure devotion is a long, long way away. So does humility have to come at the cost of honesty? It's not like that. The point here is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is expressing his humility. And when we talk about learning the principles of bhakti, it is not that we, it is an ongoing process of learning. So every time when we speak, we share, we are, it's not just the audience who learns, it's the speaker also who learns. Now sharing bhakti is not just a matter of delivery, it's also a matter of discovery. So when we speak, it is by that speaking we ourselves learn. So when, especially we speak some philosophy, and we speak some philosophical point, and somebody else is very influenced by that point. Sometimes we speak some point, and say, and sometimes there's a new class, and some devotee comes and says, "Oh, you know, this class was life changing. Really, you know, my life has not changed. How do your life change? Sometimes we may take our philosophy in a familiar way." Uh, familiarity breeds contempt. But when we see somebody else very impacted by some point, we say, oh, this must be something special. Let me tell you, let me revisit it. Let me not take this for granted. So often our appreciation for the practices of bhakti increase when we see those transforming others. So when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sees here that uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is saying that Bhakti Sudha, that he has taught me, Saram Chaitanya. But he knows the sixth system of philosophy and he has taught me about the supremacy of bhakti. Now what does he mean by that? It is that he is saying that when Chaitanya, it is he who spoke the principles of bhakti to Sarvamattacharya. But when a person as learned as Sarvamattacharya got transformed, then that means this bhakti philosophy is really glorious. So in that sense, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu learns about the philosophy of bhakti from seeing the effect of that philosophy on us. So it's not humility and honesty being two non-intersecting circles. We can be honest, but we can always speak the truth in a way that is humble. And <clears throat> then when he's talking here about Ramananda Rai, he's saying from Ramananda Rai, I have learned about the flavors of bhakti, about the sweetness of rasa, of love for Krishna. And it is not just sweetness, but it is also greatness. So this is life's greatest purpose. So why is love for Krishna considered the Purusha Shiromani, the greatest purpose in life? So basically, we all have <coughs> desires. And to be conscious is to be desirous. Whenever we are conscious, that means we observe certain things. We observe certain things, oh, this is good, this is not so good. I want this, I don't want this. So to be conscious is to be desirous. Now when we have the desires, what do we do with these desires? So basically, the four Purusharthas, which are the Purusharthas? Vriyana, Karma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. So now, what is what are these? Are, all these four purusharthas, the four purposes of life, are basically different ways of processing our desires. What do we do with our desires? So dharma is the first step. That is, don't just indulge in your desires. Follow some discipline. Follow a live a life of virtue. And actually, this kind of virtue, discipline, regulation is required not just in the spiritual way of life, it is required in every way of life. If somebody wants to become a musician, somebody wants to become an author, somebody wants to become an athlete, they have the desire, but it, the first step in fulfilling the desire is dharma. Dharma means regulation. 
discipline. We can fulfill some cheap desires. I want to. I just want to eat. I want to watch TV. I want to. Uh, just uh, you can have cheap pleasures, but desires which are more deeper and meaningful. That it begins first with that. Discipline yourself. Then through discipline, what happens? Artha. Artha means the resource. By discipline, we get the resources for fulfilling your desires. So, if somebody wants to be a author, then by dharma, by discipline, they start developing the skills. They learn how to write, which words to use, how to construct sentences, what figures of speech, literary devices to use, how to make the writing more attractive, poetic. So, this is artha. Artha can literally mean. I am talking about these in a generic sense in terms of dealing with desires. Artha can specifically refer to money because money is a resource by which you fulfill desires. But artha can also refer generically to the resources for fulfilling desires. And then after artha comes karma. Karma is the specific desires that we have. We try to fulfill them. So through discipline we get resources, and through resources we fulfill the desires. And this is the trajectory of life which most people try to follow. Now many people try to go to karma without dharma and artha. Say somebody is born wealthy, then they can just gratify their desires. But such people who do not go through dharma and artha to get karma, soon their life becomes meaningless. Why meaningless? Because you just keep gratifying, gratifying, gratifying. It, it just becomes pointless. So we make sometimes fulfill karma without dharma and artha. Like people uh, get into just cheap pleasures. Say somebody just thinks, whatever I feel like, I'll eat. Whatever I like, I'll drink. And then eventually what happens? People who just keep gratifying karma without dharma and artha. If we keep doing whatever we like, we end up disliking ourselves. You know, hey, if somebody just keeps eating whatever they eat, then they become sick, then they become, uh, they start becoming physically not very attractive. Or oh, if a person just is tough, studying, just keeps surfing the net. And one day, two days, just days and weeks they spend just playing video games or watching videos or whatever. And after that, you know, they start having a very low self-esteem. Because they start looking down on themselves. What am I doing with my life? I'm just wasting my time. So sometimes you might fulfill some karma without going through dharma and artha, but that doesn't lead to any deep fulfillment. That just leads to disillusion. But the problem is that even if we go through dharma artha and then come to karma, still there is not much fulfillment. Even when we fulfill our desires, we don't become fulfilled by the fulfillment of those desires. Because there are so many desires, I fulfill one desire, then I get another desire. Then I get another desire. Then I get another desire. So then, so dharma, artha, and karma are one way of dealing with desires. Another way of dealing with desires is moksha. Moksha, it means it's liberation, but liberation is not just primarily like a physical relocation. Oh, you get out of this material world. Liberation primarily is, you could say, psychological. Liberation is essentially liberation from desires. Moksha is the desires to enjoy the world. So the soul is here, the body is here, and the world is here. The desire to enjoy the world bind the soul to the body and the world. So liberation means the soul says no more desires. Fulfilling desires doesn't lead to happiness. So I just give up all desires. And in some ways, so giving up desires can lead to peace, no more agitation. But then, what happens? We don't just want peace, we want some activity. Sometimes when we are very fed up with the people around us, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. We want some privacy. But you know, if people forever left us alone and nobody ever wanted to talk with us, you know, we would say, no, 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 I didn't mean forever alone. You know. Sometime I want to be alone. Isn't it? So, if we just reject all desires permanently, that's not a sustainable state. So, what is the best way of dealing with desires? It is what Prema, when it is said, is the Purushartha Shiromani. 
what it means is that use your desire to desire the desirable, the supremely desirable. So desires are not the problem, the direction of the desires is the problem. So what Bhakti says is that everything attracted in this world comes from Krishna. Yadyad vibhuti matsattva shrimadurjita mevama tatta deva vachattva mamatejo amsha sambhava Everything attractive manifests as part of Krishna's spirit. So Krishna is like the ocean of attractiveness and everything attractive is like a drop of attractiveness. So when we learn to direct our desire towards Krishna, then what happens? The more we become absorbed in Krishna, because Krishna is the supreme desirable, therefore, by connection with Krishna, we start getting the supreme joy. When we become our consciousness when it is connected with Krishna, when it is absorbed in Krishna, it does not need anything else. Just that absorption itself is enough. That absorption itself brings fulfillment. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is saying over here that from ph philosophically, I understood from Sarvam Bhattacharya that Bhakti is the supreme purpose of life. And experientially, in terms of rasa, from Ramanandra, I understood that the mellows of devotion are the sweetest. And thus, he's saying over here that love for Krishna is life's supreme purpose. Now, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu takes this conversation forward, we'll discuss in tomorrow's class. I quickly summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is this in the demonstrative Bhakti Vaishnava Siddhanta to Vaishnava Sadhachara. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, at the peak of his career as a traveling preacher, suddenly stops traveling. It's not that he's stopping sharing, but he's savoring bhakti uh, in Jagannath Puri. He's teaching how to savor bhakti. And he's getting his closest associates to him so that he can take bhakti deeper into their hearts. So through them, he will be sharing bhakti. And he is demonstrating the six-fold loving exchanges with a wide gamut of people, those who are his followers, those who are his equals, those who are his critics. So how this sadacha, the proper behavior with different people can also be used to share bhakti, that's what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu demonstrates in Nantilila. And specifically here with, uh, when dealing with Vallabha Bhatta, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu starts by introducing his associates. And he gives a very personal introduction by placing himself as their subordinate. That he has learned from them. And when he speaks in this way, he actually doesn't just simply glorify them for the sake of glorifying, but he's glorifying in a way that brings to a philosophical point. And the philosophical point we discussed is that love of Krishna is the supreme purpose of life. So basically, to be conscious is to be desirous. And how we deal with our desires determines our life's destiny. So dharma, artha and karma are basically discipline, then acquisition of resources and then fulfillment of desires. So without dharma, artha, if somebody gets karma, then it becomes very meaningless. If we keep doing whatever we like, we end up disliking ourselves. But even with dharma, artha, with discipline and uh, acquisition of resources, we get karma, there is a more fulfillment. There is maybe a little... Uh, more fulfillment, but still it's not completely fulfilled. For some people say, I just give up all desires. And they go toward moksha. But that is not a sustainable state. Because we don't just want peace. We want love. We want reciprocation. So, the way to deal with desires is to direct the desire toward the supreme desire. So, everything that is desirable in the world comes and gets its desirability because it's a part of Krishna. When we love Krishna, then instead of getting drops, we get the ocean of happiness. And that is what brings supreme contentment. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, is there any question? Yes, please. You can. I was just wondering what. Makes uh, liberation so attractive. What what attractive? Liberation. What makes liberation so attractive? It is usually the 
you could say it's the best among bad alternatives <laughs> so if you don't know anything better if <clears throat> it's like if somebody is sick and then they are uh, they may be have arthritis or something like that so every bodily movement causes pain then they will start thinking that if i could just stop moving i'll be free from pain and it's it's correct but it's not complete so the pain is superficially caused by movement actually it is caused by sickness but when there is a superficial diagnosis of the problem then if it, oh if i move it causes me pain if i just stop moving i'll have relief so but what will happen even if they succeed in stopping moving is difficult but even if they succeed and they do become free from pain afterward soon they want to do something so similarly whenever we have desires and we try to fulfill our desires we often get into trouble because of that and then we feel i could just get rid of desires i'll be free from this trouble so that's a understandable misunderstanding that it it appears as if desires are the cause of trouble but rather it is not the desires but the kind of desires so we could say that if we learn if, if if somebody becomes healthy and then they move they will not be pain in fact the motion will bring activity bring joy so similarly when our desires when we are when as if consciousness is unhealthy then whatever desires we have they cause us trouble and if we just let me give desires but if we make our consciousness healthy we purify it by practicing bhakti then the desires that emerge in a pure consciousness they actually bring joy the prabhupad his we could say at one level his speciality is of course many of his specialties but as compared to his god brothers his speciality was that he had the strongest desire to share krishna bhakti with others his desire was so strong that it overcame all obstacles and through that desire so many people have across millions of people have tasted a love for krishna so liberation appears attractive because if one doesn't know about pure desires then either it is it is desire which are mostly impure impure desires or desirelessness among those two options for people who are a little bit more in sattva the desirelessness seems to be the better option thank you please do yeah okay you mentioned observed krishna what do you mean observed krishna observe yeah observe absorb yes. okay absorb so what is absorbing ourselves in krishna mean it essentially means that our consciousness it can go in many different directions say right now you are hearing this class so you could say you are focused on this but say if your phone beeps and you know, then your consciousness goes over there so our consciousness goes in various different directions but if we focus on krishna so focus is a more a act of conscious attention or conscientious intentional attention but absorption is more spontaneous when we have attraction towards something then we don't have to exercise to concentrate we just naturally we become absorbed so say somebody is studying a physics book say quantum physics you know, concentrate to understand what's going on but somebody is a cricket fan and they are reading the latest cricket news you know, they don't have to exercise they naturally they get absorbed so absorption means that our consciousness naturally goes towards krishna and goes deeper and deeper into krishna and that comes through purification so now we have to conscientiously focus on krishna by effort that's sadhana bhakti but as we become purified what is that conscientious focus will gradually become spontaneous absorption okay thank you So, for example, if there's an artist who's very much absorbed in what he's doing, or what he's doing, and then at a state, for example, he reaches a state when he is really happy and into the zone of the art, so uh, he is fully absorbed there. 
does he still need to come out of that zone and go towards the liberation of Krishna, uh, like towards the absorption of Krishna? Okay. Because he mm -hmm. probably he doesn't have that many desires, but he's fully absorbed okay. in his art. Good question. So if an artist is in the zone, absorbed, and still be able to come out of that absorption and go towards devotional absorption in Krishna, whatever is anyone's deepest experience, that is their experience of Krishna. Even if they don't know that. That means that whenever somebody is very greatly attracted to something, say as an author, uh, as a famous poet William Wordsworth, he said, he wrote a letter to his friend, he said, I spend my morning very productively today. I worked on one of my new poems. After breakfast, I added a comma to the poem. Before lunch, I deleted the comma. <laughs> so I mean, three hours, I'm just thinking whether the comma should be there or not. I said, what is the comma? What is there in comma like that? Now, what is, what is this flavor is getting in that? Actually, that is a manifestation of Krishna. But they may not know that. So what is it so attractive about art? What is so attractive about poetry? What is it so attractive about sports? You know, it is people are experiencing the spark of the divine. Krishna says, Mama Vartamanu Vartanti Manusha Pantha Sarvesha. Everyone is on my path. So, so we could understand this in such a way, say Krishna is at the end of this path. And there are people along this various places along the path. And wherever they are, they are attracted to something, they are absorbed in something. Say so somebody is an alcoholic, they are just they, they drink alcohol, they so captivated with alcohol, they forgot everything else because of their drinks. Or somebody is an artist, they absorb in art. They forget everything else. So both the attraction of the alcohol and the attraction of the art, ultimately it's a spark of Krishna that is manifesting through them, through that particular thing. So everything attractive comes from Krishna. But everything attractive doesn't necessarily take us to Krishna. So alcoholism, if they get absorbed in that, now somebody with him, who is not an alcoholic, they say, why do you spend so much money? Why, do you, why, is, why are you so caught with it? But they are caught with it. So because it's they are experiencing something extraordinary over there. But that is taking them away from Krishna. So yes, now art is definitely much more elevated than alcohol. I'm not comparing the two at all in the functional sense, but in the philosophical sense, you know, whatever we experience, it is an experience, very deeply, whatever the deepest experience, it's an experience of Krishna. But if we understand it's an experience of Krishna, then it will take us to a Krishna. So Prabhupada said that if somebody is an alcoholic and they cannot give up alcohol, then while they're drinking alcohol, they can think that the taste of alcohol is Krishna. Krishna says, Rasoham of Sukhamte, I am the taste of water. In 7 8 in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna Prabhupada expands that. He says, I am the taste of alcohol. Now, Prabhupada is not saying by drinking, as Prabhupada says, if they think of Krishna in this way, one day they will become great devotees. He is not saying by drinking alcohol they will become great devotees. Okay. It is by thinking about Krishna while drinking alcohol. So, we all have certain experiences of which are very deep. We don't necessarily have to give, those, give up those deeper experiences. But we have to connect them with Krishna. So uh, there is, we could say that it's a big subject, but quickly an answer is that there are broadly two understandings of devotion. There is exclusive devotion and there is inclusive devotion. Exclusive means you forget everything else and just practice bhakti. Say for example, come to the temple, chant the holy names, worship the deities. So we exclusively focus on Krishna, you know, putting out everything else. But inclusive devotion means we understand that Krishna includes the world. So whatever I'm doing in the world, whatever engagement I'm having, whatever experiences I'm having, I see them or I find how I can connect them with Krishna. So devotion has to be exclusive to be inclusive. If we don't directly experience Krishna, then whatever else we experience, we won't realize that we are experiencing Krishna. And then it will be a, it will be like, you know, an artist in his home is very, very absorbed and they are in an extraordinary state. But that state itself will not take them toward Krishna. They'll have that state maybe as long as their artistic intellectual faculties are there. And once those faculties wane, then what will they have? 
But if they understand, if somebody is an artist, then they will naturally do that art very diligently. And they should. So Arjuna, when he was an archer, he was absorbed in the archer. There is that famous example when Arjuna is asked, uh, all the students of Drona are asked to shoot at a bird, they ask, what do you see? So, they say, oh, I see this tree, I see this branch. Arjuna sees, says, I see only the eye of that bird. It's interesting, Arjuna doesn't say, I see Krishna over there. Hmm? So, he is focused on that target. But, he's, he is, his life is devoted to Krishna, his heart is devoted to Krishna. And thus, his archery also becomes a devotion to Krishna. So, there are some things in the world, if we can, if we are naturally absorbed in them, then that's good, at least we have some absorption. But, if you can connect that absorption with Krishna, then that absorption will not only give us some shelter right now, but that absorption will also take us towards the Supreme Shelter. Okay? Okay. So, yes. You had a question? You had a question? Okay, my question. Yeah. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare. You mentioned about Jaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, stops being a, a traveling preacher and then stays at one place. And then uh, I missed out the initial part of the class, so I was wanting to know uh, what does it mean for uh, practicing devotees who are engaged in a specific type of service earlier and then uh, if at all there has to be a change because of uh, you know age or health reasons. Yeah. So, <laughs> if we are doing a particular service and then we have to change it because of age or health. Yeah, see, bhakti is dynamic. We can say that so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Puri and he refused to meet the king, Pradharutra. Srila Prabhupada was the greatest follower of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the modern times. And <laughs> Prabhupada was on a tour of the world and he cut down his tour to come back to India to meet Indira Gandhi. She was the head of the state. So Sanyasi, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, should minimize association with materialistic people, should minimize association with the opposite side. Now, Indira Gandhi was a materialistic head of state and she was a female. And still Prabhupada came all the way just to meet her. So in terms of externals, what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did and what Prabhupada did was opposite. But the purpose was the same. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's concern was not that I don't want to meet the king. See, at that time, the reputation of a sannyasi would go down if a sannyasi is hobnobbing, hobnobbing with a king. You renounce the world, why do you want to associate with the world with this But in today's world, it's different. You know, if a spiritual teacher is meeting with the head of state, that will increase the reputation of the spiritual teacher. That won't decrease it. So, the, this example I gave is so that service, the intent has to be consistent. The practice can be very In fact, it will be very So, how we serve, it depends on person to person. Our health, our inspiration, our guidance. So, yes, if we are not physically able to do a particular service, you know, we have to find out what service we can do. So, each service we do, is like a, a path for the river of our consciousness to move towards Krishna. Mm -hmm. But if one path gets blocked, it says Kunti Maharani says, Gange Vogamdhamati. Let the river of my consciousness be like Ganga flowing towards you who are the ocean. So when the Ganga finds one path blocked, it finds some other way to keep moving on. So similarly for us, if one service we can't do, then we have to find out, okay, this path is blocked, let me find out some other path will open. So we do whatever service we can and we stay connected with Krishna. Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much. Shri Chaitanya Charitam Ki Shri La Prabhupada Ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Shri Chaitanya Charitam